Hello. In this episode, I'm really excited to say that we got to sit down with Professor Paul Thomas. Professor Paul Thomas is arguably one of the world's leading experts in truffles. Uh, he's very much into truffles, truffle science, their biology, their relationship with the world, climate and everything. And it was a real pleasure to pick his brain and get some real valuable golden nuggets out of him. Uh, in this episode, we talk about the threats and opportunities as it relates to truffles, truffle farming, the black truffle, the white truffle, you know, where are truffles diminishing in the world as a result of climate change? Where are they actually potentially going to be uh, in abundance in the years to come as climate change changes slightly? So that's fascinating. We talk about an amazing experiment he did with his kids over lockdown, uh, where they investigated wood lice and the poo from wood lice as they ate uh, truffles and what that meant for truffles and how the dispersion of truffles happen so amazingly fascinating uh stories there we talk about how he has actually created a little truffle um orchard alongside of his house a little a hedgerow and what you can do at home to create your own truffle hedgerow using lime and all sorts of other little techniques uh, i dive and pick his brains on all sorts of things like with regards to how can I test the soil in a potential truffle location using pH tests uh, and what not to do, what to do. So that's fascinating as well. We also talk about truffle dog training because he's just got a new puppy as well, which is fantastic. Uh, there's literally so much golden nuggets in this episode and it was a real pleasure to speak with him. Uh, and, you know, I hope you enjoy this episode. If you like content like this and you want to be updated, you can either subscribe to the podcast, subscribe to the YouTube channel or just join the email list. Go over to Truffle Forage dot com and you'll get notified you'll get updates and you'll get access to some really awesome content so without further ado enjoy this episode i'll see you on the other side cheers hi paul how are you doing yeah uh yeah good thank you ben good uh good to speak to you um yeah and great to speak to you uh literally very grateful to you for um even just being on the, the podcast and i'm tremendously excited to, to to ask you some questions and things like that i know we connected um, just before Christmas at, at the uh, the UK Truffle Festival, where you you know you kindly gave up your time and travelled all the way from Scotland in a, an electric car, no less, uh, <laughs> to come and be our our main speaker. And um, you know, from all reports, uh, you were fantastic. Uh, unfortunately, oh, I was running around like a headless chicken and didn't get to <laughs> diagnose too much of it. But I'm I'm so grateful to be able to catch up with you now and uh, pick your brain a little bit. So um, really welcome and and thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, the festival was great, actually. It was really well run, well run event, and uh, I think much needed in the UK. So it was uh, it was really good fun. I'm really glad we we got there, and hopefully we'll be there again next year. Eh? Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, we're, we're uh, Melissa and I are just sorting out, um, you know, bits and bobs trying to lock down a venue. But um, really cool. excited for next year, which is cool. And uh, hopefully, yeah, you know, we can tease you and get you on board as well again. It'd be great to have you. Um, Paul, what I wanted to ask you to kick off with, like I didn't really know this until someone fed it back to me between we're speaking now and the festival. But um, you've got your own dogs, uh, am I right? And you're, you're, or is it dog or dogs? And you're training them up to hunt truffles yourself, are you? Is that right? Yeah, just one actually. Just so one. I've got, um, I've wanted one for ages, but you know, traveling so much and all those kind of things. And now the kids are at an age where they kind of kind of help out with a puppy or theoretically help out with a puppy <laughs> so so we got one uh just before christmas and she's doing great but um she's been sleeping really well but she was up a lot of the night last night so apologies if i'm a little bit uh a little bit hazy and fuzzy today but um between her waking up and kids it was a it was a long night but um but she's great she's great awesome what 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 sort of dog is she and how's how's things going yeah how it's uh, yeah, so she's only, what would she be now? She's like 20 weeks old or 21 okay. weeks old. And she's probably the most masculine breed you can imagine. She's a, she's a toy poodle. Um, and, she, and she's tiny. You know, she's only like this big, which works for us because there's five of us. We fill a car, so we need a small dog. And poodles, you know, easy to train, easy, yeah, uh, yeah, highly yeah. intelligent breed. And actually, I was visiting a, a colleague who I work on fungi with in uh, Palencia, um in spain last year and he had uh, one of these toy poodles like a really shaggy one and uh and it was great it was just like full of energy you know jumping around i was like wow how old's your puppy and he was like well four years old and i was like, oh. <laughs> you know it got my mind ticking i was like oh we could have one of these so um so yeah that's what triggered it really so she's a small dog but she she's finding truffles already and she's working great so 
Yeah. Wow, wow. Yeah, I've heard some good things about poodles. A being easy to train and good truffle dogs. Mm. And and poo. I, I can't think of how small the toy poodle is, but it, it reminded me of. Um, I was doing some research the other day, and one of the recent uh, dog winners of um, a truffle dog competition in America. I think the Oregon one. Yeah, yeah. that was a that was a Chihuahua. It was. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Well, how, how ridiculous is that? So uh, you know, I don't yeah. think size. Size does not matter, I don't think, when it comes yeah. to uh, hunting truffles. Yeah, um, I think I think if you're on bigger orchards or you're wild hunting, you probably need a bigger breed, you know, with more stamina. But I th yeah. think uh, Rue, her name's Rue. You know, I'm going to be taking her to some of our Scottish orchards and um, and uh, and you know, and just for checking initial checks on orchards and things like that. So just when I'm travelling around, so she won't need to put in too much mileage so um so she should be great yeah i actually named her after there's a wild truffle called tuba rufum which smells a bit like smoky bacon to me and i named her after that <laughs> so she's a root yeah that's so good <laughs> uh my my um my fiance's uh mum's dog's called rue as well but it's a boy ah, so cool. i'll 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 let them yeah. know that it's um potentially you know retrospectively they can name name him after uh, <laughs> tuba what did you say it was? Tuba Rufum. Tuba Rufum. Rufum. So Latin for red. It's a small red truffle and she's a red dog. So so it works really well. Smells like bacon. Tastes like bacon or? Uh, actually, <laughs> I haven't eaten much of it. They're really oh, small that's... and I'm really keen yeah. to, to do more work with that one. So I want to hunt more of those with Rue. And it's, and it's one which isn't, I don't think it's really suitable for commercialization because it's so small. But I'm just really interested in the ecology and how they grow and and if we can get them growing on certain trees, you know, if I could grow it here in the garden, you know, I just want to, it's just a species I really want to play with. I think it's quite a cool one. But yeah, but very small, smokyish flavour. Um, I think they're lovely. Really nice truffle. Amazing. Um, very excited. And there's so many, so many questions I have for you, but I think mm -hmm. it would be um, fantastic just to uh, uh, get a little bit of your, your roots and your foundations as you got mm -hmm. into the truffle world. I guess... Um, Maybe the journey started before you um, were studying at university, and if it did, mm -hmm. do do share. But um, I would love to hear the um, the sequence of events that led up to you appearing on Dragon's Den. Um, okay, yeah, yeah. Pitching your idea. So uh, how how did you uh, how did that come about? Yeah, so that was a long <clears throat> long time ago now, way way before way before I was grey. So um, <laughs> when I was a, when I was a kid, I always used to go out and collect wild food. So I was a bit of a strange kid, really. And you know, this is back in the eighties, so it wasn't really a done thing then. So I used to go out and collect pig nuts, these small tubers yeah. which grow underground, and wild leaves and berries and and even nuts and things. So I used to be into that, and then. Um, then I got into uh, mushrooms. And in fact, I think my mum trained me on that because she said I wouldn't eat at the table. She used to hide bowls of food around the house and amongst pot plants. So maybe she trained me to forage. I don't know. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> yeah, so then I uh, I got into mushrooms because they were really exciting because they pop up and disappear. You know, so they were really just transient. They'd just be like there and mm. gone the next day. So I got into mushrooms and then I went to university and with mushrooms in my mushroom books, I read about truffles and I could never find them. So I started to look into ways of growing them and I'd never tried them at this stage. And then when I started looking at the science, it just it just blew my mind. There was a lady called uh, Susan Simard over in the States and she subsequently published a lot of work on mycorrhiza. In one of her earlier papers, she looked at carbon fluxes between mature and young trees and transfer of resources between these trees through the mycorrhiza, so the fungi connecting them. And it just it just blew me away. So I ended up I was doing a PhD on signaling systems in plants, and I just got completely sidetracked. Looked at mycorrhiza, fungi, got really into truffles, and uh, what a nice way to fund it was if I could set up a truffle farm, my own truffle farm, work for half of the year on that, and the other half of the year just do research. And that was the original idea, and that's what I went naively went down to the Dragon's Den with because the university gave me some money to to do this. And mm -hmm. uh, and the BBC had approached them, and this is before they approached them saying they had this programme with investors and did they have any students with business ideas? So they put me forward for it, and, and I didn't really know if I wanted investments, so I went the night, but it turned out that wasn't the case. So, um, yeah, yeah, so that that's how I ended up in the Dragon's Den, yeah, a lot, long, long time ago. Okay, cool. Back with you. Um, hopefully the Wi-Fi is yeah. going to stick up. All good. All good. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Dragon's Den. And um, 
so I also saw one of your publications um, was, you know, very, you know, kudos, congratulations to you for like being the first um, uh, cultivator of the Perigord black, you know, truffle um, in yeah. the UK, I believe. How yeah. is that? Yeah. Talk to us about that, like, you know, was it, and and what was the journey? I mean, there's a long time between, I guess, Dragon's Den and getting perhaps the funding which led mm -hmm. to that realization but um you know here's a big question for you what happened in those 12 years and how did you uh, how did you do it uh yeah so uh, uh happened very slowly actually so after the dragon's den um so on the on the den i was offered funding by a couple of the dragons who had a, a bit of set two with each other and i subsequently went with one and agreed to go with him uh, but then after filming and his subsequent discussions, uh, I just decided it probably wasn't the right route. You know, he wanted to do bigger commercial stuff, and I'm sure financially it would have been great. But um, I, I wanted to focus on the science and getting this working and getting cultivation working and focus on that rather than doing clothing lines and foods and other kinds of things at that stage. So yeah. um, <clears throat> uh, so I, I still talked to Simon. So it was Simon Woodruff, super nice guy. and uh, But we said, decided... It wasn't the right route. So then, um, um, yeah, so I, this, rather than doing one orchard, then I started to realize if we partnered with people, so if we uh, joined forces with other growers, we, we could essentially form, uh, create a massive data set. So everyone who's grown under one umbrella, we use the same methods, the same technology, the same monitoring, and doing that, uh, from a scientific point of view, we can gather a huge amount of data and start to learn, you know, and start to see a bit further and answer some of these questions in truffle cultivation. So that's what I started to do. And it took a long time. It took a long time to scale up the technology to produce the trees. That took a good few years. And then we started to put our first orchards in the ground. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, it was a long way. And we started to do the Perigord truffle as well. So we mainly focus on our native species here, which is the Burgundy truffle, which is the one we celebrate, of course, at the UK Truffle Festival. Um, but we also did some of this Mediterranean ones, which is the Perigord truffle, Tuba melanosporum, uh, mainly to just see how it survives. So we planted them not thinking it was going to fruit, just to see how the mycorrhizas, so the the roots of the fungus, if you like, how they survived in the ground. And, and that was great. And we got some nice data. And then one was planted on a, a site where the chap was harvesting summer truffles. So he had summer truffles as well. And his dog kept going over to the winter truffle side and he was pulling it back. Bella, the dog was called. And eventually let it go over and went over and, and dug up this really ripe, delicious, amazingly scented Paragord truffle. And it was like, wow. And he subsequently harvested more. So it's it was a bit of a light bulb moment and I published that with a colleague down in Cambridge back in 2017 and we worked out the reason it's working now in the UK and why we don't have it um, naturally is that the since the Industrial Revolution the temperatures have just increased just enough and the winters have got mild just enough to allow this species to fruit and, uh, and grow here. So I think it's something we can expand in the UK but um, I'm still quite bearish on it. So I normally advise people not to do it on any big scale, maybe just a hundred trees, do it on a small experimental scale. But it's, I think it's something we need to work on more and look at where it's suitable. I should also mention actually, is after we published the paper, there was a, a chap down uh, further south. So this one was quite north, this was in Wales. Uh, further south, who also said that they produced the Perigord truffle a couple of years before that. Um, and I've, I've, yeah, which is super cool. So I've got, unfortunately, I've got no details on it. They wouldn't give me any details on it because I'd like to see soil, look at the climate where it is. But apparently they, they also did it. So I should mention that as well. Um, so yeah. So but they, they're sides. keeping it a bit hush hush, do you think? Or yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I'd love to know more details, but, uh, but yeah, but apparently they did as well. So, uh, and the, the thing that goes through my mind is as well, without verifying it, you know, I'm, it could be one of the related winter truffle species. I'm not sure if it's the Perigord, but as we produce that one in Wales, it's totally likely that further south that could fruit as well. So it's it probably is a correct statement, but um, yeah, so quite exciting. So I think probably two places in the UK. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and I know touching on that, and I know you spoke about this a bit at the festival, um, threats and opportunities with truffles. Um, obviously you've just touched on the UK might be poised to be um, going in a really good direction for um, <clears throat> lending itself yeah. to uh, experience truffle growth, probably naturally, and also people wanting to cultivate it, I would suspect. 
um, but yeah. also can you talk a bit more about that but then also the opposite side are you know if the climate is changing you know what's that having a, what effect is that having on truffles globally and and is it getting worse in certain places than others yeah definitely so um this is a big topic for me i started working mm. on this um started working on it maybe four or five years ago now started looking at climate in more detail <clears throat> and we had some really good access to some really good data sets in france spain and italy so over 40 years worth of gross truffle production data and we could correlate that with weather patterns so it's a really nice strong data set for analysis and from that we started to look at the correlations between weather patterns so between summer temperatures summer precipitation and you start to get some nice information there so that you know different conditions produce different yields and you start to see statistically some quite quite good information and then i got quite interested in well how's it going to play out you know how how will it look in the future so we uh, took that data and overlaid it onto climate change models. So these are really big, recognized, uh, widely recognized and widely used in the research community, climate change models going forward and, and projected, predicted what would happen. And the, the range we use is 2071 to 2100, because in these models, that's the, the time period we have the outputs for with, with relatively decent certainty. And, and through correlating all this data, we worked out that we're almost certainly looking at a collapse in the Mediterranean basin of this Paragord truffle uh, uh, by 2071, which is within a generation. And it was, uh, it was a big, uh, big shock really. So the model shows an almost complete collapse under one of the, the higher climate change scenarios. Uh, but within that, you know, that that's a gross level thing. So there will be small sites with microclimates where there will still be small amounts of production. But, but I think the big take home message is that we're, uh, predicting and expecting a, a big collapse in production and and this is because the Mediterranean is warming faster than a lot of areas globally it's warming much faster than the global average uh, Spain especially we're going to see very high temperatures and drier conditions and in fact we're already seeing it so in the truffle data uh, one of my colleagues Gulf Bunchen at Cambridge he's published correlations where we're already seeing these downward trends you know it's already it's already starting so uh so that's you know why I took a electric vehicle down to the truffle festival, and uh, I changed my life massively after working on that because it was uh, it, it was a bit of a shock. Um, <clears throat> and then in the UK, you know, there's there's risks and opportunities there. So one opportunity is we're growing this Paragord truffle now in the UK, which is fantastic. Um, but one of the the downsides is um, in these drier conditions. I think our native species struggles as well. And at the time we did that project, we didn't have enough data on our native species here in the UK to look at what would happen here. And we still don't really, we still don't have a very big data set, but we saw last year, you know, uh, and you know, from talking to truffle hunters, last year was very, very hard because of the droughts and the heat. And we saw a big drop in production. And this, there was a paper published just a few years ago showing that a one degree temperature shift in average over the summer months for where these summer truffles grow can cause a 22% decline in production. Three wow. degrees can make it drop completely. So in the UK, you know, the East, <clears throat> some of the center areas and, and the South fared quite badly, but our sites in Scotland, uh, we had two sites in uh, Southern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, which began production last year. Uh, Wales, the north and west of the country fared really, really well. We got really good production. And I think that's because, you know, it's got that damper, cooler climate. So we're, we're seeing this sort of mixed story in the UK where the east and the south is probably, we're going to have more suffering there in terms of truffle production, but the, the north and the west is going to fare a bit better. And the thing to mention as well, of course, the north and west doesn't traditionally have much truffle because the soils aren't really suitable. So the ones that are coming out are coming from cultivation where we've added lime and amended the soils. But it's, mm. uh, yeah, so there's these risks and opportunities, you know, and uh, but the truffle is just a canary in the in the coal mine, really. You know, I think we're going to face, I don't want to yeah, hate to say yeah. it really, because I'm always accused of being doom and gloom, but I think we're going to face much bigger problems than our truffle supply. So a lot of my research now actually, I do a lot on truffles, but I'm also doing a chunk on climate change mitigation methods and how we can apply this technology to uh, uh, to look at solutions and ways to draw down carbon in food production and such. So it's a bit of a diversion really from yeah. truffles, but it's, yeah. Well, fascinating. With the, um, 
uh, the potential drop off in the Perigord black truffles, which you just mentioned in the Mediterranean basis. Do you um, also believe that something similar is inevitably going to be happening for the, the tuber magnatum, the white truffle that's growing in, in, in the med? Or, I mean, yeah. I guess the date the data is probably not <laughs> there. Um, yeah, so the, there is some loose data with that, again, correlating it to dry and warmer conditions. So that definitely happens. Uh, we're still trying to collect more data on that. So that the magnatum truffle grows in obviously northern Italy, um, also in Serbia, in Croatia. It's even in Switzerland. There's a river in Switzerland where there's a, a small native, uh, naturally producing area there. So for yeah. sure that will suffer. The other thing I should mention is we published a paper last year looking at um, truffle production zones all over the world. So we looked at South Africa, we looked at California, we looked at Australia. And some of these newer territories are going to be a little bit more resilient um to climate change it looks like than than the mediterranean so some of that production will move elsewhere but it's going to have to be big you know france alone plants about four hundred thousand truffle inoculated trees every single year and it's been wow. keeping their production just static and it's slowly coming down now in fact so um uh, you know you've got it's got to be done on a big scale elsewhere to counteract that kind of drop so yeah so sorry, I may have misunderstood what you said there. They're planting four hundred thousand truffle trees every year, but the production is staying the same. Yeah, yeah, it's just wow. maintaining things. And they France started fifty years ago, so they started in the seventies. They were the first really to successfully cultivate truffles. In fact, there was a chap going back even a, a hundred or so years before then who uh, produced truffles actually in France by <clears throat> lifting baby trees from truffle producing regions and seeds. And transplanting them to other fields and he thought it was the the tree that was important but by doing that he inadvertently transferred some of the fungus that was growing on that root system and some of the spore and transferred it to new sites and some of those sites produced so he's a chap called joseph talon and he was really the first one to produce truffles but then it wasn't until the 70s that they got these uh more methodical techniques and francis truffle, truffle production dropped from over a thousand tons uh, a year to what is now in a very good year would be a maximum of 80 tons and it just plummeted due to uh, habitat loss changes changing socioeconomic conditions which mm. mean woodland was managed differently and then you see this graph plummeting and then cultivation steps in and then it just kind of starts to tick over yeah 95 percent wow. of all the truffles are cultivated now in france which is incredible and in back in the uk like mm. I've got no idea, but I'm sure if there's anybody who's got half an idea, like how many sites or or truffle farmers would you approximate that we have in the UK at the minute? Yeah, it's a good question. It's a good question. There are, um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm not, I'm, I really don't know. I, I know truffle cultivators, I would say there's close to 100 probably with orchards of different sizes. The majority of these aren't hunting though. So I'd, we had, five new sites begin production that i know of last year um the majority of them with our trees so there were ones where clients had contacted us there was one lady contacted us saying you know how do i find truffles i think my trees are mature and we were like you need to train the dog etc cetera, etc cetera. we're giving her advice and she went out into the garden just had a scratch around and came back in with some pictures oh, and uh, found some truffles which is really lucky you know it's so yeah. as you know they're so hard to find even if you've got a yeah a narrow area so she found some there was another guy who was picking up hazelnuts around his trees and he found truffles and uh one of the sites in ireland that was a visiting truffle dog who was only there for an hour and they pulled up just over a kilo so there's these sites and none of them none of them have got a truffle dog yet so there's a lot which aren't being harvested which is a bottleneck in the uk and something that i hope would change and something you know your event i hope is gonna is gonna uh, stimulate interest in as well so yeah yeah, awesome. I think there's a lot. Um, yeah. Um, the other thing I was going to ask you is because you've, you've covered quite a lot in terms of your scientific exploits into truffles and beyond truffles yeah. as well. But I wanted yeah. to ask you out of everything that you've done, perhaps in the past uh, or something that yeah. you're working on now, what, what's currently like really captivating you at the moment? What's exciting you at the moment? Uh, uh... It's all science. It's all research. It's all, all research. That's the, the most exciting thing for me. We discovered a cool thing last year with insects and truffles, and we're growing that. Uh, this climate change mitigation stuff, we're applying for a bigger grant at the moment to try and take that forward. We've got a PhD student working on it. Oh, and we're setting up um, a lab to focus on that in Scotland. 
uh, which will also have a very small truffle museum attached to it, like one of these quaint agricultural museums, you know, that you see dotted around. We're going to have one there with information boards and so people can visit freely with a demonstration orchard. So I'm really excited about that. You know, school kids can come up, a small educational facility where we can, uh, yeah, educate people. So, um, yeah, those are my main things. It's all it's all research and education, really, are the super exciting stuff for me. Yeah. What's the... Um... Can you talk me more about the insects and truffle one that you just dropped in there? What's, what's yeah. going on there? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> this all started back in, a, uh, back in the pandemic, actually. So in the pandemic, I had my kids home from school and um, they weren't doing any online schooling at this point. So I thought, you know, their education is really going to suffer here. So let's do some stuff. I had a DNA testing equipment in my cellar. It's PCR, so it's just simple DNA analysis. I say simple, but it is relatively complex and um so i had my kids my four nine-year-old six-year-old and uh i guess she was 10 or 11 at the time daughter i had them doing serial dilutions and doing dna analysis in the cellar you know Gosh. to try and keep their education going and then i thought well let's do some experiments as well and i looked back at those notes actually and thought what the hell was i doing you know that was too much too much for the kids but we looked at doing some experiments as well i thought let's do some hands-on stuff getting them really interested and i'd, I'd often found a uh, wood lice with truffles these tiny little insects and i was talking to my son about it and it's like well we don't know if they eat them we don't know if they're sheltering in them we don't know what's going on so let's let's find out so my daughters went out and collected some wood lice from outside they made them nice little homes you know and uh and we we like all good uh kitchens in scotland we had some truffle in the fridge so we uh, fed them some truffle put them in these little homes and then we collected their uh, their poop and we collected their poop and they lay these little square fecal pellets. We put them under the microscope and lo and behold, they were just packed full of spore. So I thought, let's do this in a more uh, regimented way. So we made these these homes that my daughters made. We've men turned them into proper little microcosms, so proper replicated groups. And we did this in a really controlled way and my son bless him you know every hour he was collecting the wood lice poop putting it under the microscope i was sat there with him he was counting the spores in them we were taking pictures looking at them and we discovered some super cool stuff so we discovered when the wood lice eat the truffle out the other side and they preferentially eat truffle they love it out the other side it's just their poop is just spores it's just a mass of spores so they're not digesting the spores they're passing them through and when we took the truffle away we then checked the poop as well to see how long the truffles are still coming out. And uh, it went on for 24 hours. And then I was like, well, we're going to have to move from hourly because we need some sleep. So we'll do it daily. And we got to like day 10. It was still going. We got to day, I think it was 18 or 19. And still 25% of the fecal pellets, we could still find one or two truffle spores undamaged in the fecal pellet. So when an insect has consumed it, they can go off walking for 18 or 19 days and still be dropping these pellets. And uh, with truffle, truffle spores in, and this is important because the spore provides the uh, truffles need male and two opposite male and female strains, if you want to call them that, to come together to produce the actual fruiting body. So it's like pollination in plants. Mm -hmm. So you need some mechanism to get the spores in the ground, and it's we're kind of unsure as to what that is, but it look it looks like insects might be quite a good vehicle for that, and uh, and there's some good genetic data that backs that up as well. So, so that was really exciting. So we published that and my son's in the paper and uh, my daughter's are in the acknowledgements. Uh, so that was really cool. And then we've uh, taken it further. So I was in the Czech Republic with a team of uh, academics a few months ago, just before the festival, in fact. And we went out hunting in different regions, finding new sites. And I collected lots of insects where we were finding truffles and, again, checked the digestive tract and millipedes and stuff like that, you know guts are just full of spores so uh wow. so yeah i'm really interested in food webs now and how that feeds truffle production and and things like that and it has a relation to climate as well but yeah so a long story but um truffles and insects you yeah, have super super keen on it at the moment yeah ah, that's fantastic that is literally fantastic um it, you started to touch on it there and i was i was curious about this you know with regards to um the birth of a new truffle from yeah. spores and sex and um yeah. and it, it, there's a you, your, your talk was titled sex truffle sex and uh dna or dna or something, something along those lines yeah. uh, and yeah. can you talk to us about that like basically can you educate us the the 
the novice person who knows nothing about how truffles come about like what what is actually needed in the beginnings of that yeah definitely so um truffles um the the basic biology is the what's called a mycorrhizal fungi so they grow on the root system of a tree they cover the root system of the tree or the root tips of a tree and they form a structure with a tree called a mycorrhiza and that that just facilitates uh, communication and transfer between the fungus and the tree. The fungus can't survive, by the way, without the tree. So the tree will send its sugars. The fungus sends lots of fine threads out into the soil. They gather nutrients, transfer them to the tree. So they have this uh, mutualistic partnership where they're sharing resources. So that's that's how the fungus grows, and that's where the bulk of the organism is. The bit we see, the truffles, are just the fruiting body. It's like the apple. Of the apple tree it's just a bit with the reproductive material in and um <clears throat> and truffles to form these truffles it used to be thought that the mycelium could just bud them off like yeast they could produce them clonally but we now know that's not true we now know there's two what we call mating types need to come together to form the truffle and these are uh, catchily named idiomorph one one and idiomorph one two so we don't call them male and female there are two variations and actually, some fungi can have tens of mating types, you know, a whole wide range of mating. In fact, I'm quite distracted by the, uh, behind you, Ben, there's, a, oh, there's yeah. a mushroom on the shelf. What What is that? What species is that? Do you know? Or... I don't even know, to be honest. Um, yeah. I put it put it there just for a bit of decoration because uh, there's <laughs> yeah. quite, a lot of, quite a lot of mess in our upstairs study here at the moment. But um, yeah. yeah. Well done for catching that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. If it's too distracting, I can move it. No, so I was going to say that some fungi like this, above ground fungi, they can have many yeah. different types of mating types, really complex uh, life cycles. So truffles just have these two. <clears throat> and what needs to happen is the, the fungus, which is growing on the root system of the tree, it, it say if that's idiomorph 1-1, one, one, it needs the other type, 1-2, to come into contact with it to form the truffle. And we know this from very good uh, genetic evidence, so we know that needs to happen. And But how that happens is currently, really, it's currently unknown. So we don't know if that's coming from other uh, mycelium colonies in the ground, so other fungi colonies coming together underground, or if it's spores coming in and, and forming that parental partner. So allowing that, if you like, pollination, that's what we call it in plants, it's pollination, but below ground with fungi, it's different terms but it's this it needs this coming together of of the two strains yeah go on, go on. Or, or just to clarify for my own yeah. head so there's there's two different spore types that need yeah. to come together to then build that create a new are we talking a new truffle fruiting body or are we talking a new beginnings of a mycorrhizae organism yeah good point so the truffle fruiting body, just the individual truffle. And this happens for individual truffles. So it's happening for each individual truffle or, or probably truffle cluster. So this is, you know, this is going on all over in the ground where you've got truffles in the ground. The reason why we think it might be spores is through genetic evidence, when you look at the truffle, it looks like the parental side. So the bit where the material's coming in by spores or another mycelium, uh, that's, it looks like it changes quite frequently so it's never the same uh contributor you know so you can see that you can see that in using genetic techniques so we know it changes quite frequently which suggests it's something being brought in and not something which is existing solidly there in the soil which suggests spores you know so that's the evidence we've got which points towards it being spores or mycelium being dropped um it's not 100 percent, but that's possibly what happens um, I don't know if I've made that too complex, but no, no, it's fine. I'm going to ask some more clarifying <laughs> questions. And so, yeah, in order for us to produce a new truffle organ fruiting body, mm -hmm. does one truffle fruiting body only produce the one type of truffle spores, or does it produce both? Yeah, good. good. Yeah, it produces both. Yeah. Okay. So when you look at the truffle, the white bit in the truffle. Is, a, is connected to the tree. So it's the, the mycelium. So the white bit is, is only one mating type, but the spores it produces are both. They'll have both male and female in those spores. Yeah. So, so one truffle could create another truffle in and of itself within the spores that are within it. Yeah, absolutely. If that truffle degraded there in the ground, you've got all that spore in the spore bank and that could further propagate more truffles. So yeah, nice. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And when you're, when you're, 
in your process of truffle cultivation, mm -hmm. do you go that deep in terms of looking at a microscope to make sure that two spores of this different types are connecting? Or do you just have a pool of enough spores that you know that two are going to mix? How does that work? Yeah, absolutely. So what we or do... Or am I getting into too secretive uh, of the, no. the technique? Is it... If you could talk about this, this would be really awesome. Yeah, definitely. So when we create trees, uh, we make sure there's there's a huge mix of genetic material in there. So not just male and female strains, but a whole mix of different uh, genetic colonies in there. <clears throat> so they're quite diverse when they're planted. But then when they're in the ground, what tends to happen is you get one mating type slowly starts to dominate and they can locally dominate in areas, you know, they can slowly start to take over. So then as truffle cultivators, what we want to do is make sure we can keep production going and make sure that doesn't become an issue. So it's quite popular now, actually, in some circles to add spore to your ground, you know, via different methods to add more spore in there to help <clears throat> to help propagate more truffle truffles so that's uh, so we have some techniques around that we have helper bacteria we add to facilitate to facilitate that um and you can get some really good results it typically takes about 16 months to see an impact uh, but depending where you're applying it and how you're applying it that can be really beneficial in truffle cultivation and in fact in spain you know like <clears throat> years ago they always used to take the rotten truffles at the end of the season ones which they couldn't sell and they just plow them back into the soil and uh and subsequently, we know, you know, that was probably a very good thing to do. You know, it's uh, it's good. It spreads spreads that spore out. But um, insects, you know, will do that very naturally. They'll take bits of rotten truffle and, and, and spread that for you, along with a nice little pellet of nice bacteria and uh, fertilizer and stuff like that. And they'll leave it right next to, you know, in the in the root zone, you know, where we've got a lot of uh, where we've got a lot of root activity. So yeah. nice. Um I'm sure largely you deal with a lot of like bigger scale cultivators, but if you mm -hmm. imagine, because, you know, currently I don't have our own property and so there's no point mm -hmm. in me planting a blooming uh, truffle tree or anything yet. But yeah. in that, I, I do, I would like to do that on a small scale. I'm sure there's others, mm -hmm. but so imagine someone's talking like in the back of their garden or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, they're thinking of like, oh, you know, I'm going to live here for a while, so I might as well have some fun, plant some truffle trees. Um, mm -hmm. First question is, I mean, you said you could add the necessary ingredients to the soil to overcome places which weren't optimal. Yeah. Is that possible? And, and how does that look like? And then, and yeah, so that's my first question. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, so you definitely can. So that one of the biggest soil uh, important parameters in truffle cultivation is soil pH. So it's how alkaline your soil is. So if you're on chalk, if you've got a problem growing rhododendrons or azaleas, that's high pH soil. So that's probably quite good soil to start with. The majority of soil in the UK isn't like that. It's quite acidic. Excuse me. So you want to add lots of lime to the soil. And we're shooting for a pH level of 7.6 or above. So um, I've done it here. I've got a little truffle hedge here where I've planted trees super close. And I've just added lots of that. I'm in Scotland with a very acidic soil. And I've added lots of lime to the soil and then planted my hedge. So that's yeah, one of the key things you need to do. And then you need to do good weed control around the base of your tree so it can really thrive. And um, yeah, no, those are your key things, really. And on, on your own truffle hedge plant, when you've added the, the lime, I guess, as the main yeah. ingredient to um, correct the pH, are you how are you testing the pH? And are you adding a little bit at a time, I'm guessing, doing it bit by bit so you don't over over ph it <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely actually uh, so ph is what's called uh, uh it's another technical term it's called a, a logarithmic scale so it means that as we're going higher we need proportionally a lot more lime to achieve those high levels so it's actually very very hard to get too high and what i did here was i tested my soil i worked out roughly how much lime i needed and then i added a shed load more so i just like totally maxed it out and i've only done it in a small band unfortunately online so far so i need to do yeah. it <clears throat> further out into the grass and that's the job for this winter i just haven't got around to it yet so I, I dug it in in this band and uh just added shed loads of lime and so i could still see it in the ground and uh yes yeah, so i think my ph there is probably about eight at the moment around the trees so it's quite high um but the mycorrhizae is thriving when i check with the microscope and now i'm you know i'm training my puppy up so uh yeah so she's uh Hopefully she'll be hunting that yeah, hedge, yeah. you know, when the season starts next year, this year, sorry, later this year. Yeah. And what's the, um, 
what would you recommend as the best way for someone like me to test the pH of a soil? Because I, I thought oh, yeah, about yeah. doing this, uh, even for looking at potential truffle sites to go to, like I'll go there and one of the things I should probably do is just test the pH. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would you, how would you recommend? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the key thing to avoid really are you'll, you'll find in gardener centers, DIY stores, they quite often sell a pH meter, they call it. So it's like a little disc with two metal probes coming off that you're supposed to be able to push into the soil and it would tell the pH. And in our experience, it, the ones we've had, they, te they say they give you the same figure no matter what the soil, they're really highly inaccurate. So you want to use a um, <clears throat> a a glass bulb probe so you can buy these ph meters online uh, they're used in hydroponics quite a lot so that's a really good source for them and what you do is you take the soil you mix it with the same weight of water mix it into a slurry and you put the probe into there and you can calibrate these probes as well and they're super accurate and that's definitely by far the best thing to do um so yeah you, you'll see them are sold in hydroponic shops of which we've got lots in the uk or or uh, science retailers online. But yeah, one of these, wet, uh, it's like a glass bulb probe and make sure that it's one that you can calibrate and that, yeah, they'll be, you typically you'll get those for 30 or 40 quid. Um, so some towards the cheaper end and that, that should serve you pretty well. Amazing, that's that's so good. I'm, I'm so gonna do that. And, and also I just thought um, you mentioned, you know, Plant, planting your truffle um, stuff outside or, or even yeah. in the early days of planting any truffle orchard mm -hmm. you know I think you said it takes 18 months approximately for you to start to see traction is that right or... oh that that's when we have the spores so that's to see a difference oh, okay. when we add spores and bacteria to the soil typically when you plant your tree we normally advise when people are doing an orchard is testing the roots every year so you can see if there's any issues there and monitor it but in the UK climate, it seems to be about six years before you begin production, um, assuming it's well managed. The mm. caveat to that is a lot of people haven't checked before year six, and a lot of people don't even check at year six, actually. But the ones that are checking, year six seems to be about right. But you do get some spontaneous early production. We, I was out of site California just a couple of weeks ago, so there's a truffle festival there, Napa Truffle Festival. We've been running for 11 years, and we visited an orchard just before the festival, uh, we one of the dog handlers you know they're doing training and we were looking at plant health and she called us over and we're kind of ignoring it and these are four-year-old english oak trees and uh yeah she dug up uh, half a kilo of truffles uh, just around these young trees so it does it does happen on young trees as well it's uh, a question of hunting really so if you were to plant in the back garden you'd be looking at at least six years and when you're doing it on a small scale it can be longer you know it can be shorter because there's a lot of variation in truffle production. When you do it on a big field, it kind of evens out. But when you're doing it on a small scale, you could be this end of the curve or you could be this end of the curve. So, yeah, and nice. management really helps. So. Um, one other thing I wanted to ask you was, um, with regards to check, looking under the microscope to mm -hmm. see, to, um, I guess, see if for truffle activity, um, would that be a viable approach or, you know, in the same way that I just mentioned, I'm looking for going around, looking for sites, testing their viability. One thing I might do is go and check the pH, but you know, another thing I might do is go and grab a bit of soil, come home and check it. And mm -hmm. a, a, do you think that would work? And B, any tips on where you would get the soil from? Like, you know, I guess just anywhere around the tree, I suppose it's so, yeah, I guess that's my yeah. question. <laughs> How would you do yeah. it? <laughs> so you mean looking for roots, Ben? You mean looking for roots and looking for the truffle fungus on the root system? I think so, yeah, because like yeah. Buddy, buddy at the moment, like he's, he's hit and miss. He's, he's early days. Yeah. And it's probably going to take, I think with any truffle dog, it's going to take years for them to really become like 100% yeah. reliable. Yeah. Um, and especially when you're looking at new sites, it's like mm -hmm. everything else, could the box could be ticked, but yeah. if the dog's not like, uh, you know, superhero just yet, then they yeah. may not, you, and then you might doubt yourself. But then, if I can test the pH and then test the soil and physically see uh, truffle activity, um, yeah. the more I say it, the more it sounds like a good idea. But would it, would that work yeah. in practicality? Yeah. So there's a couple of things with that. But just on the the truffle dog thing as well, I think that's a really good point. You know, when you're when you're training a dog like we're training Rue. Uh, they work great when there's a truffle there, you know, when they're going to find it within a couple of minutes. But if you go into a wild site or a new orchard, mm. 
they'll get bored very quickly, right? If they don't find a trouble yeah. within three or four minutes, like, what am I doing? What's the point? And that's where a lot of the training and the reinforcement and the yeah. additional And doing that is in. actually detrimental to your dog's training. It will push them back yeah. rather than <clears throat> feed them up. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, and if anybody yeah. out there is training their dogs, they're like me, they'll want to, like, skip to level 10 before they've done level 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Yeah. So, yeah, it could be challenging sorry i interrupted but yeah would that work then do you think and is and how would you go about that the microscope soil testing yeah so um so you can check for mycorrhiza the two things which make it quite difficult one is in a wild site uh you need to be lucky enough that where you've taken the sample from this truffle mycorrhiza there number one yeah. you know they could be a meter away from that point or they could be 30 centimeters down even in a truffle orchard, once you planted a tree after a year, you've got maybe nine species on that tree at least. You know, you you get a high diversity. So um, so you've got to be lucky to find the truffle mycorrhiza in a wildwood. The other thing is, uh, and in an orchard, you can find it on most root samples. On 80% of root samples, you'll find it. But in a, in a wildwood, it's different. Um, the other thing is identifying it is really hard. So you'll see pictures online, you know, and we've got pictures on the website. You get these kind of inflated club-shaped structures that's just part of the story. What we do here is <clears throat> we've got a whole checklist of things we look at to make sure it's the right species. And then we even, we crush the root tip and we put the, the cells under a different microscope to look at the surface cell shape and size. So it it's quite a technically yeah. demanding thing. I've seen like people on YouTube and stuff and they'll use a hand lens and go, oh yeah, that's truffle mycorrhiza. But it's, <laughs> it's like, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah, not really feasible like that. You know, you you need you need to tr you need to put the hours in and 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 train and make sure what you're looking at is that. Otherwise, you'll be looking at some other fungi and tricking yourself, really. So I think I think the best thing for you, Ben, is really pH, um, yeah, and focusing on that and making sure you got the right trees as well. You know, it's the right kind of woodland because some trees obviously won't harbor truffles, so you need to make sure you got the right species there. And. On on under the microscope, uh, with mm. with the sort of more um, well known truffle species, mm. is there quite a lot of variance in what they look like under the microscope? From like say the the Melanosporum to the Magnatum, I'm guessing there's quite a big difference, but maybe there's closer. Okay, to yeah. So that so the, there's two things there. There is difference between species, and uh, there totally is. There's there's differences. You know, there can be some similarities, but there's different things like we call, for example, ramified, like some. Truffle mycorrhiza will have you'll you'll have the truffle bit and other truffle bits budding off it, whereas some species won't do that. So there's there's different things you can look for, but also within the same species, you get a lot of variation when you're looking just on the dissecting microscope. Depending on how mature that mycorrhiza is, you know they they, they can look really different, and that's where mm -hmm. when we trained people here, so we haven't got a lab assistant working on this at the moment. We normally do, but. Right at the moment, we don't. The, the previous one's gone to university, which is great. Um, <clears throat> so we need to train someone else. Typically takes us about eight to nine months to get someone really well trained on it. And they'll be doing that like most days, you know, just looking at mycorrhiza. So they start to get a really good eye for the variation, uh, even within a single species. So it is it's quite a complex thing. The way around that is to do DNA analysis, but that's quite expensive. Mm -hmm. So you can send it off to independent labs. They can do a PCR test. Uh, typically about 50 to 80 quid, I would guess, depending on the labs. So it gets expensive quite quickly, depending on how many samples you get. But that gives you a binary answer. You know, it's a yes or no, whether the species you're interested in is there or not. Uh, and that's what we recommend people do for independent testing if they want someone else to look at the roots and they want a, a clear answer. We always say use the DNA lab because that gives you a, it removes the user error, you know, and it, you know, then it's not going to be someone there with a hand lens pretending they know what they're doing. Like the DNA will give you a hundred percent result. So yeah. Fantastic. So from your point of view, it's hard going. You know, you're going to yeah, have to yeah. use soil pH and put the hours in. I think is the is the I only so. thing you can do. Yeah. Keep working on buddy. Yeah, my my plan is to just just yeah become obsessed with truffle dog training and dog scent training. Yeah, so cool. It will happen. What what are you doing now? But what what are the stages you're at now? So Buddy obviously finds it when you bury it and things like that. And what's the what's what's the next stages you're working on? Um, so we, I mean, we've sort of paused any scent training at the moment just because mm. new job start, new year, and all that stuff. Um, and I think I was lucky enough. You know, Melissa took me out um, 
just after the festival um because we we're just too cool. busy leading up to the festival and that was amazing that's where buddy actually found his first um truffles in cool. a wild a wild place which was really yeah. cool and and inevitably that was very powerful because he was shadowing yeah. her dogs yeah. um but you know i was really impressed with what he did but and then i went to other woodlands afterwards which arguably i shouldn't have done but i was enthused by the fact that yeah. he'd done it and think thinking about what i said a second ago in terms of you put your dog into a wild woodland and they don't have success yeah. then then you know you could actually be doing damage um however you know you can easily rectify that by having some truffles with you and doing training in the woodland yeah. which is what i did so actually it was still a result it's just for me i was disappointed because he didn't find more so um i think i'm i'm going back and i'm relearning um because yeah. i think there's there's a lot of stuff that truffle hunters do and teach you know the mm -hmm. the more artistic side of things and the mm -hmm. more old school which has probably been passed mm -hmm. down passed down passed down but then on the complete other end of the spectrum in terms of scent dog training, you've got like, you know, the scent dog training world, which is like mm. science based, you know, police handler dogs, scent dogs and all that. And then it's very mm. much formulaic and there's probably mm. a lot more um, data and research behind that. So I feel like I'm I'm now I'm I'm actually um, embarking on some truffle scent courses on that in that space mm. Mm -hmm. to take all the knowledge from there mix all the knowledge that i'm getting from learning from other people truffle hunters and my own experience mm -hmm. and then combining it all in the middle to mm -hmm. turn buddy into a super truffle dog mm -hmm. <laughs> and and you know mm -hmm. share the journey share the journey through the podcast share the journey through yeah cool. uh, youtube as we go that's the plan um yeah. but yeah i'm currently i'm just doing scent wise yeah. i'm just doing um more fun games with him so buddy's ridiculously good um, so now I just I've just started getting him. I'm honing the skill of like a find it and retrieve, which arguably is not what. You, yeah, so you wouldn't. I guess ideally, yeah, I'd like him to dig up a truffle gently, yeah. pick it up in his mouth and retrieve it to me. So yeah, perfect, perfect solution. I'm walking through the woods. <laughs> But he's just running off left, right, and center, and he comes up with a truffle in, and I pop yeah. it in the bag. Like I guess that would be, you know, yeah. almost the magical scenario but i think it's possible yeah. you know i've seen i've seen people do that have dogs that yeah. can retrieve but i also know that it's very dog dependent you know yeah dogs will naturally gravitate to one behavior or another but at the same time the trainer can yeah. train set craft craft their dog into whatever they want really i think within reason but um yeah yeah yeah. yeah yeah what's your what's the uh instincts feeling like of uh rue at the moment are you like oh yeah she's gonna be a beast at truffle or or are you a bit like, unsure at the moment no i think she'll be uh i think she'll be fine at it you know like she uh she finds it indoors easy and then i just started burying them outside and just straight away it was no problem yeah. for her so i think uh from talking to a lot of truffle hunters and stuff it seems to be dogs can get distracted at certain point on the life if they start to get more interested in mice or pheasants or something like that can be an issue but i, I hope we will be okay you know but i haven't got to i haven't even got to where you're at stage with buddy now so i think got to do some more work the other thing with the retrieving thing i think is interesting the american guys we work with the american teams they say they they try to avoid that because when the dog digs it up they can damage the truffle yeah. um and they, but they call it an autograph. They say the truffle's been autographed when there's like a yeah, four yeah. marks through it. But um, I guess that's one of the issues with retrieval. But I, I don't know if that. It depends yeah. on how good Buddy is at it. I guess. I, I don't think I'm going to go down the route. I think I'm going to yeah. get him to do a lie down indication. Um, yeah, cool. Yeah, which I have sort of started doing. But yeah. yeah, the the beginning stages. I didn't do specific truffle scent training with Buddy until, yeah. you know, at least four or five months. All I did before, yeah. although saying that, I was still doing scent stuff. Yeah, uh, I think the main the main thing, and I think this is important for any dog owner, especially pet dog owners, yeah. is just to create uh, everything that I was doing was just building it around creating the most confident dog I could possibly do. Yeah. Cool. Whatever I was doing is like, well, yeah. if he's if they're if he's a confident dog, nothing's yeah. going to bother him. You know, dogs become reactive because they're not confident because they're fearful or you know they have anxiety yeah. over something. And then you get dog behavior problems, you know, but mm. if you can create a confident dog, it sets you up for being able to then train them into whatever you want. Um, yeah. But then alongside that, we were just doing, in, in, mainly to save our skin, 
when he was going yeah. through puppy biting mode like we would do lots of find it games and hiding you know yeah. kibble he's got labrador in him so he would he would okay, uh, yeah. you know whatever the food was he would hunt for it yeah uh, yeah and hoover up the uh, the air that we were in yeah uh, um that's interesting. Other, yeah. The other thing that I would uh, suggest to you as well to like be almost yeah. like a pill, a pi one pillar to focus on. Yeah, you can do the truffle scent bit and the confident yeah. dog, but another pillar is like because is determination and resilience. Mm -hmm. You know, as you said, mm -hmm. you go out in the woods. If they haven't found something in three minutes. Yeah. Um, they might give up. So mm. you, you might have another dog that would wait. Uh, you know 30 seconds before they give up then you'd have another yeah. dog who would never give up like there's a whole yeah. spectrum and depending yeah. on what dog you've got you you know you don't know but you can encourage that drive you can encourage that drive and make it make it uh more intense like and and yeah. that's something i did in the beginning um like simple things like encouraging drive with toys um mm. you know having your partner hold the dog back and then you're waving the toy in in the dog's face. Whether we did it a okay. lot, with a we did a lot with a tennis ball because yeah. you know a lot of lot of scent dog training, traditional scale police dogs. You know, the the reward is always a tennis ball. So I'm like, yeah, okay, then it doesn't matter what it is. They just got to associate the highest level mm -hmm. of uh, you know reward mm -hmm. and drive for them and happiness and fun and joy. And yeah. for buddy, for buddy, it is a tennis ball, but it could be something else. And mm -hmm. then you would mm -hmm. you would just you know, for example, you would just wave the toy or the tennis ball. And a squeaky tennis ball works well in the beginning because obviously yeah. it works well. And and then your partner or whoever, you could even tie the dog, um, would hold them back. So they're like itching yeah. to get away. And and that itchingness before they actually okay. get the release, that is releasing all the um, chemicals, whatever that is. Yeah, and then yeah. that's helping build and reinforce that drive for the ball um, or drive yeah. for whatever it is. But And then yeah. as well as increasing the drive for the ball, you're also just generally, I think, increasing the drive in the dog. Um, yeah. That's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. And uh and then also when you're doing the the scent games as well, it's like you've also got to strike that balance, I think, between, you know, if your dog's not finding something that you've hidden, whether it's a piece of food or something yeah. else, I do think you have to balance between okay, they've not found it, and now you're getting frustrated because they've not found it, you're trying to wait, and then you know, the temptation is to like you know, go and help them and stuff like this. Um, but yeah. I think you've got to strike that balance between not helping them and then learning yeah. that you're not going to help them. Because yeah, if they learn that yeah, you're yeah. going to help them, they're going to like keep looking to you. They're like, oh, yeah. my dad, daddy's going to step in at some point. And at least for yeah. Buddy, this is how it's worked. I yeah. just did, I mean, I'm like a stone brick wall often, uh, yeah. especially when he can't find it. If I throw a ball in long grass, sometimes he'll, mm. he could, you know, miss the scent. Mm. So, um, so yeah, mm. things like that, but definitely the the drive one, and mm. I was quite, and it also becomes a very good safety tool mm. because I know now that Buddy is like religious about a tennis ball. Mm. It's like if he mm. knows it's on me, or if he knows he thinks he's getting it, it's mm. a safety thing. I was much more confident with him being off lead anywhere, pretty much, if I had a ball yeah. on me. Um, yeah, and and that is huge, and and, and especially yeah. if um, you know, you know, when you're out and about, and there's there's game and deer and mice like yeah that's an another one you you know is the tennis mm. ball that you've driven built the drive up stronger yeah. than his natural prey drive or her natural prey drive yeah. for a squirrel that's running um yeah so yeah it's it's a, it's a difficult one and as best as you can yeah. you want to avoid any uh um scenario where they actually do hunt something and then have the end result like they've grabbed it because yeah. then you've just they've just had the result they've had the experience and then you're going to have to work you're, you're going to have to do 100 repetitions now doing the right thing to overcome yeah. that and you, you know, every time that happens it's crazy so it's best to yeah. you know number one rule of dog training i think is management and control just don't let it yeah. just don't let it happen in the first place and yeah yeah, yeah. It's long lines i'd still take buddy out on a long line yeah um, yeah. So uh, how do you build that drive into the tennis ball? So are you, you not letting him have it all the time? Are you taking it away in between training sessions so it's like a special yeah. thing? Or, 100%. Yeah. Or, yeah. For what we did, and people probably do things differently, mm. in the house, um, toys were not left around ever. 
you know, oh, wow. freely. Yeah, yeah. We would have, and obviously when a puppy, you know, you've got the biting mm-hmm. and you have to put something in their mouth. So we would have mm-hmm. like allowable toys, like, you know, those mm-hmm. nylon rubber bone things. Mm-hmm. Or mm-hmm. one thing that was really good was the, uh, those coffee tree roots that they sell in pet shops mm-hmm. and things, which is like, okay. it's basically, basically like a stick, but it crumbles. It doesn't splinter. So it's yeah. a bit health, bit safer for them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so letting him have those type of things in the times where he's awake, but you don't want him to chew the yeah. sofa. Yeah, but then toys would be coming out when you know it was either playtime or training time plus playtime. Mm. Um, but mm. with the tennis, with the tennis ball thing, yeah, I think we started with a you know smaller tennis balls that squeaked mm. and just mm. doing a lot of um, I think I did it in the garden, but I also did it in our little hallway, which is you yeah. know narrow walls and then yeah. doors on either end, so yeah. you can be at one end and basically the, the dog can't get past you so you know what they want to do is grab it and run forever but what you want to mm. try and what you want to try and do is um i guess begin to get them to fetch basically yeah, fetch yeah. is actually not an easy thing to to do all the yeah, time but um yeah. working in a corridor yeah. uh does does help with with um doing that yeah. sort of stuff um, yeah. yeah, then just squeaking the ball. And I think the other thing as well, which I adopted really easily because, yeah. A, I think I was just so driven to do the best out of Buddy, but you have to be the life of the party. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. you literally have to be a three-year-old idiot to your yeah, dog, yeah. even Absolutely, in public yeah. as well, you know, yeah. with your voice, with your mannerisms, and just yeah. because if you're if you're like playing with a toy and you're just doing nothing and you know you're yeah. expecting them to get the enjoyment out of the toy that's i think yeah. the wrong way to do it they need yeah, to get yeah. the enjoyment out of the toy that's attached to you because you're yeah. you're holding it you're releasing it or that's another good thing with um how's the biting stage with rue at the moment is it is it there yeah, good actually good? yeah so she's she's been there so she's been doing it yeah and then we've uh you know she tries to chew uh wooden furniture so i've just been giving her sticks and that's how, but I just stop her, you know, she's doing it. I just say rude, no. And she just, that's the only time I use anything negative is to stop yeah, yeah. her biting. Everything else is positive. And, uh, and yeah, she's, she's good with it. She'll, she will sometimes if she's hungry and, um, and sometimes right at the end of a walk, cause if we walk to too long, she'll, she circles and she'll bark. So I've just been working on stopping that. Um, yeah, or yeah. trying to mitigate that but I think that that toy thing is brilliant because we have uh, toys out all the time you yeah. know so uh, and I always I it am like a three-year-old I, yeah. I play with them like that but yeah. I think having one special toy like you were saying and keeping yeah, that yeah. away and just bringing it out for special occasions is a super good idea and then yeah. over time um, and yeah. I've got this from I guess uh, speaking to lots of other dog people and truffle hunters yeah. or more, more dog scent trainers is once that and maybe it's not a tennis ball. It might be another toy that she yeah. gets. Whatever that toy is that takes her to level ten point one, you know, yeah. over the or one hundred one percent crazy for it. Um, yeah, that then becomes the truffle dog training toy reward. Yeah, yeah, yeah and it yeah. only comes out then. Yeah, you know, so um, that's what I'm moving on to with Buddy. But at the same time, I would still take a tennis ball out with me for the safety reasons and things yeah. like that. But, that's um, super good yeah I'll, I'll definitely do that because right now we use tiny pieces of cheese because she she's really she doesn't eat that much you know she's not really yeah. food motivated which i hadn't yeah. quite realized about this breed but um but cheese she is so i discovered cheese she's she's down with cheese so we use that as a treat but i'm very aware as well that uh there'll come a stage in her life where we have to be quite careful of that because you don't want to yeah. just feed her loads of calories right when you're training yeah, or yeah. when you're hunting because that could backfire i presume so uh, a, a toy sounds like a really good uh yeah really good way to do it and if you get into any uh i mean if she likes me as well one thing i did i mean buddy yeah. and I've, i'm lucky with buddy because you know pretty much will eat anything you'll do anything yeah. for, like kib- kibble but um yeah i i i quite i had a little um food project going on last year where i'd start making my own biltong Oh, okay, um, you cool. Know, with relatively yeah, yeah. cheap cuts of beef, but um, yeah. just hanging and and then drying it. Mm. And I thought, you know, compared to the price of like a beef dog treat you get in yeah, a dog yeah. pet shop, it actually works out way less if you make wow. a decent bulk of like you know um, yeah. silver side beef, 
and then you just yeah. cut it up into little cubes and it's preserved and it lasts a long time so wow that would be yeah, my yeah. recommendation if your dog's fussy like if it's if it turns its nose up at uh you know stay yeah. Uh, yeah basically that, that would be funny but yeah yeah she just um but i think it's uh the other thing is it's a bit of a control thing isn't it so i started now if she doesn't eat a food within a few minutes take it away and that's it for a few hours and then put it down because she was becoming quite fussy so i'm slowly learning it's my first dog you know and oh, so all nice. this all this stuff is super interesting you know and it's super good stuff and we've got her doing she's pretty obedient she's really good she does a lot of sit puts a paw out she'll turn around you know she's got lots of tricks but it's things like this you know that just didn't occur to me and all, all stuff i need to learn so yeah it's really really useful stuff yeah awesome awesome um i actually on. on the yeah sorry go on. yeah no, no 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 you go you go yeah, sorry. I, I was going to say actually on the I could dog talk thing. about dogs forever, so don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, well, they, well, this dogs links and truffles. Do, yeah, this links dogs and truffles actually. So um, we just had a paper published uh, today, which is open access. Anyone could go on and access it. And it's uh, we did a, a study in uh, Cambridge Botanical Garden, so I'm part of a group who is doing the analysis in this. And we had a um, <clears throat> a researcher go out and follow the same path every time they were out with a dog, with a trained dog you know, and uh, obviously a trained researcher and look for truffles. And uh, as part of this, this tiny bit of the analysis didn't make the end paper, actually. It's buried in the data set. But uh, sometimes we did this on consecutive days and where you took exactly the same path, the same dog, the same handler, uh, similar conditions. On the second day, you, quite often we'd find truffles again on the second day, even though that area has been covered. So it's uh, it's just got me thinking more and more about that you know, there's so little research done on the actual truffle dog side of thing. And, you know, it's it's really clear that dogs, you know, they're like people and, you know, they have good days, they have bad days. There's, there's things which impact that scent distribution, but also when does the truffle release the scent? You know, what's happening? So we're, we're trying to do more research on this at the moment. And I'm actually, uh, I'll mention it to you now, Ben, just in case if you start finding with Buddy and if you're interested in taking part, because we've got a few months before the season really starts, but I've got people in the US and some in Europe where where they're going to go out and do the same transect, it, and it can only it, it it can be as short as 100 meters, and then counting how many truffles and weighing them and grading them that they found along the way. But importantly, doing it on consecutive days and yeah. doing that a couple of times a month and just logging the data. And we're doing it for a range of truffle species, so we can start to build up an idea because then I can link it with weather patterns as well. So I can bring down the climate data, look at what's influencing how the dogs are finding stuff and, and what the drivers are. So it's it's super interesting. So if you start finding with Buddy and you fancy taking part, let me know, I'll send you the protocol sheet. And if there's anyone else, because the more, the better, and we can anonymize it so locations won't be given, anything like that, you know, in the paper. It's just to build this data set and so we can all learn and, and work out what's happening going forward. So, uh, 100%, yeah. yeah, that sounds awesome. I'll have to have quit my job by then but or, uh, you know, get, have the time to do it. Yeah. But, uh, that also reminded me, and mm. so the the best moment of my life by, mm. by quite a long way, and probably Danny's life as well, is um, Julie who you met at the truffle oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah from the real truffle hunters she yeah. invited danny and i out to go white truffle hunting with them yeah best and like properly white truffle hunting none of this yeah. like you know thing done yeah. for tourists and they, they don't even yeah. do this so it was like just yeah. an invitation to live with them for like four days wow blew, blew my mind beyond belief yeah. and was obviously my first introduction yeah. to you know i, I, I smelt and ate my first white truffles and other species yeah. as well is mind-blowing but one yeah. of the things that really struck me as like different to what i was expecting it was mm. i was kind of expecting um to go to some area and then mm. we'd be out for hours you know just walking yeah. and just doing a route yeah and and i think maybe that can work in the uk in certain places but yeah that wasn't how it was at all because of the nature yeah. of the land and where these things are it was like yeah Right, we'll we'll off road four by four into the bottom of this valley, and then we'll get the yeah. dogs out five ten minutes. Truffles, yeah. no truffles. Okay, boom. Next site. Yeah. Uh, truffles, no truffles. Next site. But what was interesting relating to what you were saying yeah. was over three and a half or four days is what we did it. Yeah. The the team of truffle because there was a team there, and they got twelve mm. truffle dogs. You know, the team yeah. of truffle hunters would be going to one site. Um, 
in the evening before we would go to it in the morning and walk over the same spot and yet we would find the truffle yeah. in the morning and they wouldn't have found it absolutely and not even overnight but even we would go back to the same spot from morning to afternoon and then find yeah. a truffle in the afternoon at yeah. the site that so uh um julie's partner and one of the other truffle guys that were there you know their suspects were like you know the truffle and this is probably not based on you know someone mm. with your background but you know more of mm. a truffle hunter's background mm. their belief mm. was that maybe it's sort of releasing its um scent yeah spontaneously within that sort of time frame and uh yeah yeah so i think there is something there because i experienced yeah. it <laughs> yeah, know, yeah, yeah. yeah i mean obviously there's some variables there you've got dogs you've got different dogs yeah. but um you know sometimes we did it with the same dog so yeah. it's like well the same dog like missed the scent in the morning and got the scent in the afternoon or yeah. something like that and then we found yeah. like truffles it was it was crazy yeah um, definitely when did you do that then what time of the year was it you were there last weekend of october okay cool yeah yeah, yeah. so right in the yeah. thick of it yeah, yeah yeah right in the thick of it i mean there apparently yeah. it's still like a really bad year for them as well but we, yeah we, i mean we found some good big truffles i think the biggest one we found was yeah. a 172 gram white truffle yeah. um yeah. so yeah obviously we didn't get to eat yeah. that but like um fortunately yeah. they the, the way that they deal with yeah. their truffles is they were only really the ones that were marketable were ones that were like yeah 10 10 grams or above so all yeah. the small little nuggety ones which are either imperfect yeah. or even if they're just so small they wouldn't they wouldn't sell them on so yeah we got to eat all of those which was which was yeah. really nice and uh, just incredible yeah. but and when they're super fresh like that the aroma is completely oh. different isn't it to the ones you sometimes see for sale and you you know which might be 10 days old or something yeah. and they're super fresh especially that white truffle it's just like it's yeah. just it's a different thing yeah, yeah. well I've, I've not actually had the experience i don't think with ex yeah. smelling smelling not yeah. smelly white truffles other than yeah um i can't remember the name of it but with one of the white truffles that we dug up was um you know quite big probably the size of a golf yeah. ball and a half yeah. uh, but yeah it, it didn't really have the uh, the intense aroma and um yeah. i can't remember what judy said whether it was like just an unripe one or maybe it was just a yeah. bit of a dud a dud um, okay yeah, yeah but interestingly yeah. though um and this is not just like them yeah. doing this but that that truffle would still get sold off and mixed in with all the other very yeah. smelly mushrooms because it would pick up some of the aroma but yeah i'm just re i'm just reading so i'm getting sidetracked here but i'm just reading yeah. that book um truffle hound at the moment oh um, right i haven't seen that yeah so so it's such a good book i think it was published in mid 2021 but um obviously by someone who's very good at writing as well and somebody ended yeah. up getting fa fascinated about truffles and it's just his journey but yeah. um one thing i didn't realize is with the industry is chefs and restaurants buying them they don't care about the aroma when they're buying them which okay. is just like mind-boggling yeah. like this the truffle yeah. should be you know primarily sold on like it's yeah freshness and aroma because that's yeah. hardly what you're buying but they just want to get the right size truffle that's big and can shave nicely on top yeah. of the thing so it's uh I'm, I'm just sort of yeah exposed to that recently but it's, it's i'm just um i, I would say that's that. I, yeah, I think yeah. that's some of the messaging that i need to get out to the world and like yeah why are you buying your truffles based on size but for restaurateurs yeah. and chefs, you can understand why, because they're in it yeah. just for the money, not maybe necessarily the experience yeah. um, or the taste. I'd, I would say it's quite varied, that, actually, because some of the chefs we work with, certainly Ken Frank, who hosts a festival out in the States, he's like a truffle nut. And yeah. um, uh, for a lot of the ones we work with, it actually, you know, they are really keen on aroma. So they, uh, a couple of the ones we supply in Scotland, actually, they don't really care about size and shape. They just want that fresh... That's aroma, but, be, I, but, sure. but I think it's different everywhere, isn't it? Because yeah. exactly like you say, I've had them in restaurants where you get almost no aroma and they're just using it as a dressing. You know, that truffle might have been there for a three, four weeks in the restaurant and they're just using yeah. it for a window dressing, whereas really you want the uh, you want the pungency. Yeah. I must say, I've never quite had the, uh, the, the, the wallet to experience white truffles in a, in a restaurant yet. So maybe, maybe I'll yeah. learn um, wrongly or rightly, but the other... I, actually, I haven't been. Oh, I haven't had... Have actually, put my hand up. I've not had white truffles in a restaurant. Lots of the blacks and summers, but I don't think I've had white, fresh white truffle in a restaurant. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, yeah, same boat. Yeah. The other thing I 
I mean, this is just me having a rant now and a moan, but we went to a nice mm. restaurant in a Christmas time with my with my family, and uh, mm -hmm. they had um, on the menu they had uh, it was in the UK they had um, yeah. autumn truffle, autumn truffle in the yeah. description, and I yeah. thought, okay, you know, I'll order this yeah. and uh, yeah. and hope for the best. Well, probably won't get a massive portion, but I was yeah. at least thinking I was going to get some fresh truffle. Yeah. There and I was probably my judgment was clouded because um, yeah a couple of weeks before like uh, we had about eight hundred grams of truffle left over from the festival so I was running yeah. around Brighton and other places like a maniac yeah. speaking to chefs and like yeah you want to, we ended up preserving them all but um, yeah but that maybe misled me because I was thinking oh I'm definitely going to get uh, some fresh truffle yeah. for this meal that came out it was a fish dish uh, and yeah. I ended up taking a um, spoonful of the sauce and I was I was I was almost put off to grotesquely because obviously they just used um truffle oil and i think they oh, right, too, yeah. too much truffle oil and yeah. uh you know i'm now i'm obviously been spoiled because you know i just spent a weekend uh yeah. eating white truffles all weekend and then yeah. you know going to a truffle festival and eating some really fresh truffles and then so i've got the taste for it but then i think once you do get that taste for it and then to be hit with uh yeah you know the the arguably the, the chemically um, flavor or the intense flavor, it, it really put yeah. me off. But then I thought, and I don't know what your thoughts are on this. Mm. I think it's miss, I just think it's miss selling. They can't put autumn yeah. truffle. They, they, they surely need to put truffle oil or something or, you know, something. Anyway, yeah. I, I'm really hesitating to rant because it really wound me up, you know, so yeah, much yeah. so that I, I uh, was prepared to, um, in fact, what, what there's the last nail in the coffin. I was, complaining around the table to my parents making them like look at me and frown and sort of my brother was like yeah. cringing because he didn't want to be embarrassed by me making a fuss but yeah and then i then i ate the fish and it was it was actually nearly stone cold so i ended up ah, no. uh, yeah. being a little moaning cry baby and i sent my food back and, and didn't ask for anything more so uh oh, that's fine but, um I, th I think the truffle oil though it is uh like some of the chefs we work with you know they rant against it and i know uh uh, the ones which are closest to me definitely don't use it but i have been in a michelin star restaurant you know a newly awarded one and i won't say which one and the first uh, taste which came to the table you know it's a special occasion like i think it was our anniversary or something so we splashed out and uh and it was listed as truffle and it came and it was truffle oil you know i could smell wow. it coming to the table and i was like come on and uh yeah there was no truffle in it it was truffle oil and that's a michelin uh michelin star i'd received a michelin star well and it was like i'm gonna oh. i'm gonna put my flag in the ground now and say that yeah. i'm gonna try and ban this somehow you know it's misleading yeah but, you know you yeah to, and they're obviously just profiting from it but yeah um, but one thing we should say is what it actually is really ben as well the truffle yeah. oil because they use a they use one compound which is uh, similar to, well, it is the same compound, be it distilled from petroleum or however it's manufactured, uh, as to one of the aromatics in especially white truffles. So it's just one aromatic compound and they use it in such high quantity that it's really overpowering. But in a real truffle, you know, you can have like three, 400 different volatiles and they're all contributing. And as yeah. you know, you know, when you've got truffles, they've all got a slightly different smell they've all got a character you can line them up and they're always slightly different and it's uh it's just a more complex thing isn't it it's truffle oil i think desensitizes people to what truffles actually are but, yeah yeah and, and, and this this yeah. guy um i forget uh rowan jacobson i think is the author of the truffle hound but yeah he's oh, talking okay, about, right. talk, talk, talking yeah. about this as well and, and yeah. i think now there's a i mean i, mean, I don't want to poo poo on any um truffle businesses that are selling truffle oil but i think the next yeah. phase now is truffle oil made with real truffles but um what i've yeah. just read in uh rowan's book is in order for them to be able to say that it's made with real truffles all they're really doing is using some you know yeah. little piece of um, not one of the more yeah. desirable expensive truffles or the one that's even yeah. probably got even that much flavor but then that's what they're doing now and so yeah it's it's uh it is what it is but at the same time it has its place i think truffle oil um yeah and then there's people that actually start to like the taste of truffle oil related dishes and products and stuff which is almost a different yeah. kettle of fish but um yeah but one thing i would say though is um you must have seen the or heard of the the uk company truffle guys uh I, truffle guys i'm a oh, big fan like they've yeah they've two two guys i think they must be london based but anyway they're yeah. they're 
philosophy as I guess is to create truffle related products that are a bit more affordable yeah. but um, yeah. I haven't tasted all of them but they've got this truffle dust and okay, okay. it's not yeah. like a fresh truffle fresh yeah. out of the ground and stuff but yeah. actually when you haven't got those things I would yeah. really recommend this truffle dust it's um yeah it, it tastes good it doesn't really taste overpowering you can sprinkle it on like anything yeah. uh, and yeah and yeah, so I'm a big fan of that. So kudos if yeah. they're listening. Like, that's a great product. Uh, need to try yeah, some yeah. of your other products. Send me some. Cheers. <laughs> Definitely, <laughs> Definitely uh, review them. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, cool. yeah. Is that is that made with a? Is it made with the additive? Is it made with that truffle aroma, as they call it? Is it just because you they can do it in different concentrations? Yeah. Black truffle oil is the same chemical, just less of it. You know, uh, so so they can do it in different amounts, can't they? So maybe it's off the top of my head. I can't yeah. remember. Uh, yeah. It's been a while since I, I've actually looked at the back of the label. But, um, I mean, there's obviously something going on there. It's not like yeah. 100% truffle. Um, mm. But, anyway, it, it, was, it was a good product, um, I felt. but Yeah, I'll look that up. Yeah, yeah. Good tip. Um, yeah. Paul, I've got just one last question because yeah. I'm, you know, I'm conscious of your time. And um, it's, good. it's been great so yeah. far. We've covered a lot. Yeah. Um, and I know this question, you've probably been asked it quite a lot, but uh, and I'd love to just hear your thoughts on it. With regards to growing, cultivating white truffles, the tuber uh, magnatum, yeah. uh, where are we at with it? And uh, what's the challenge with it? Yeah. And <clears throat> what's the future like? Do you think we're going to crack it? Really? Yeah, so it's a really big question, actually. And I've uh, <laughs> been doing the rounds over the last year and a half with a... Uh, science publications like we did with an article in nature one in uh, wired one of the online publication we've done quite a lot on white truffles so um um where we're at with it is they try to use techniques very similar to the perigord truffle which began production back in the 70s mm. um, and applied it to white truffles and until very recently that's been largely unsuccessful and i would estimate that at least a million trees inoculated with white truffles have been planted across europe and the success is, there was, uh, there was a success case in Italy, which was presented at a conference. We subsequently sat there and sort of pulled it apart and the truffles were found on the edge of where the planting was, right bordering a natural truffle producing wood. So it looks like it was actually from these wild truffle producing trees. So that was subsequently withdrawn. Um, hmm. So that's not really right. Um, and then before I get into the successes, I wanna mention a bit about the ecology. So when you were out hmm. with Julie, um, what's quite interesting is where you find white truffles in the ground, quite often you can't find the mycorrhiza, you can't find that bit of the organism attached to the tree. Mm. Sometimes then when you find the mycorrhiza in the ground in the wild, you don't find the truffles. And this to me hints that its biology is more complex and maybe it's only mycorrhizal, only attached to the tree for maybe only part of its life cycle. And there's other fungi which can do this. They attach to a plant for part of their life cycle. Then they can go off and breathe free living and live off decaying matter. And so I think its biology is more complex. Having said that, there was, uh, you probably saw in the media, you know, a French team who claimed to have succeeded producing truffles. Uh, and I believe them actually. So I've looked at the data, I've looked at the papers on it. Um, it's really interesting. They've produced a small number of truffles on, uh, I think it's two or one or two orchards, and uh, and it looks legitimate. One thing I would say is super exciting. One thing I would say about it is, bear in mind, there's like a, over a million trees which have been planted, and we've just got these few successes. Um, we don't know how to replicate that, so it's not clear what what they've done that is different because what they've done is very similar to what's been tried elsewhere. So there might just be something there in the ground which has helped it to work. Um, the other thing is they stopped monitoring the mic. This is quite telling. They stopped monitoring the mycorrhizae, you know, the, on the root tips of the trees in that orchard because they're hard to find. And they started just quantifying the DNA from the soil. So that just tells you that the organism's there. It doesn't tell you it's attached to the tree at the time. So it's, um, Super interesting. You know, obviously, we've inoculated trees in the past and we've never planted them because uh, I've never wanted anyone to plant them because of the low success rates. But we're at the, the little truffle center we're setting up here. We're doing a white truffle area there where we're putting our own trees in. So uh, have a crack at it. But I, I'd love to spend more time working on tuber magnatum because I think its biology is it's more complex. There's more going on there and it just makes it more interesting. So I think we're a long way off that being uh, replicated and that being a viable 
activity for people, you know, but it's uh, it's super exciting that we've got those results from France and credit to the team, but it's uh, we're a long way off, I think, having a repeatable system for that, uh, unfortunately, but but maybe in the future. Exciting yeah. times. Yeah. Um, and what what big projects or things that you've got coming up on the horizon that you're working on and excited about? Yeah, so um, truffle dog study I just mentioned, uh, yeah. doing lots lots more work with insects and more complex food webs and understanding how the truffle spore has moved across different trophic levels. So that's animals feeding on other animals which have got spore in the ground and things like this. Uh, we're, we're doing a lot of work with uh, DNA sequencing. So we've got this new lab we're setting up. Um, and this little truffle center in Scotland, which which should just be really cute and be good fun, and uh, yeah, all those kind of things, Ben. So it's uh, it's a million miles an hour, you know. There's just like lots to research and not enough time, and I'm just hundred percent. How 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 far? I think I remember you saying you're in a on a Scottish island, aren't you? But how yeah, far yeah. up are you? And how far up are you? And is it the west coast? And the reason I'm asking is yeah. because um, Danny's Danny's mum and her partner are. Uh, I think they just put an offer down on a, on a place like really high up on the west coast of Scotland. So, you know, wow. future future holidays and trips up there, and then it'd be great to great to come find you as well and say hello. Yeah, definitely. You have to. Well, I'm hoping to have this set up this year. Our field is currently lime. We've got 40 tons of lime sat on the surface. It's been too wet to mix it in. We're just waiting for it to be dry enough to mix in. So we'll have we'll have it all set up quite soon. So you should definitely come and visit. Um, but we're on uh, an island called the Isle of Butte, which is mm -hmm. the same. It's just across from Glasgow. So it's no okay. higher than that. So once you're at Glasgow, which you'd probably do going up the West Coast, it's about another 40 minute drive uh, west. And then you jump on a ferry, which is one every hour. You don't need to book. And the ferry is like 40 minutes. Quite often see porpoises on the ferry. And then uh, you're nice. on the island. So nice and accessible, but uh, I'm probably more accessible than it sounds like the place they're buying. It sounds like that's quite <laughs> yeah. quite a way north. Yeah, yeah. it is. They're, 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 yeah. They've uh, got their eyes set on their, their remote Scottish uh, lifestyle, and rightly so, you know. Exciting. Um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, looking forward to those trips. But um, Yeah, you have to let me know where it is. That's, uh, yeah, that's exciting. Yeah. And definitely um, call in as you're going up. Yeah, yeah definitely. And so... Without further ado, is there is there any way before we wrap up? Is there is there any way you'd like if people want to find out more about what you're up to, um, or if people are interested in, you know, truffles and trees and growing them, or, or where can they find more information? How can they best get in touch with you? Yeah, sure. So uh, the website has a contact form in. So uh, anyone for those kind of inquiries. So it's plantation systems, all one word. dot com. And uh, you'll learn more about what we do and where we work in the world and those kind of things. And then on my uh, informally on my Twitter, you know, whenever we have a new publication, a new article, uh, scientific articles, I normally post them on there. And that's just uh, at Summer Truffle. So Summer Truffle's a handle. And um, so I, I'll just post things on there. And that's all it is. It's just truffles and uh, truffle research. So it's a good one to to follow if you're into that kind of stuff. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um... Paul, it's been it's been a pleasure. Uh, really, really enjoyed speaking to you. Yep, been really good fun, Ben. And uh, yeah, thanks for chatting. And uh, happy to do it again if uh, if needed. And uh, yeah, it's been good fun. Yeah, would would absolutely love to have you back on. And um, I'll definitely hold you to that. And uh, let's stay in touch. And uh, have a nice have a nice rest of your day. Yeah, awesome. You too. You too. That was good fun. Thank you very much, Ben. Oh. Cheers.